My name is Craig Singhaas and I'm one of the organizers. Yeah, and, of, and what are we calling this? This is, this. we're referring to this as our Living History Camp. And what it does is it pays homage to our veterans. Uh, and we have groups here representing most of the major units of World War II. Uh, we have the United States Navy represented by the CBs. I, along with my compatriots are representing the United States Marine Corps. We also have several, <clears throat> excuse me, several uh, Army units as well. Uh, most notably the 29th Infantry Division which is based of Maryland National Guard units and so uh, we are let's say paying honor to those uh, folks who fought and died for this country and especially those who never made it home and paid the ultimate sacrifice. So what's your name sir? Terry Mahoney. And tell me what's going on here Terry. Well what our little cantonment is is uh, Marines in World War II. Um, we have uh, I'm doing a little display on Wake Island and because it's Memorial Day and we like to remember those who died on Memorial Day and that's where Wake Island is um, our first victory in World War II. This is a Mark II fragmentation grenade mounted on an adapter for the M1 Garand rifle that uses the M7 grenade launching spigot. What it does is you load a blank into the rifle and it shoots this grenade adapter downrange, blowing up either in the air or depending upon when you timed it, on the ground next to your target. This would in turn hit your, or disable your objective. This is a rifle grenade sight that was mounted on the side of the M1 Garand rifle as well as the 1903 series of bolt action rifles and the M1 carbine. Unfortunately, these were not very successful and a lot of them are just thrown out or given back to supply. I see you've been doing your laundry. Yes, sir. Everything freshened up. Yeah, well, it's a nice day for drying, right? Yeah. I get sweated up pretty quick. We represent uh, a Naval Construction Battalion, the 35th Naval Construction Battalion that was assigned to the 3rd Marine Division on Guam. And what you see here is a representative encampment of a duty section as they would have been working on expanding roads and also expanding the existing airstrip. Uh, you see a mixture of Navy clothing and also Marine Corps utilities. The Naval Construction Battalions were essentially organized as a construction company within the U.S. Navy. You had electricians, framing carpenters, uh, machinery operators, light and heavy machinery, all types of mechanics, electricians, plumbers. This is where the the duty section officers would be. Uh, a Navy commander and the executive officer uh, would be a Lieutenant J.G. And it, Lieutenant Inside J.G. The, tents, the J.G. stands for? Junior grade. Yeah. Junior grade. He's, he's the executive officer uh, of the unit. Again, this is a what's called a duty section, which would be anywhere from about 15 to 30 men. See, weapons, weapons are still handy if necessary, even though uh, there has not even been any sniper fire now for a couple weeks. Uh, the island pretty much is secure. These guys will be withdrawn from Guam and then sent uh, eventually on to Iwo Jima, where they will continue expanding the existing Japanese airstrip. Hi, so tell me about this gun. It's a, This one's on display permanently at the Powell Post 31, the American Legion Hall. It's a 37 millimeter um, anti-tank right, uh, anti gun. So that just means the length of the, the size of the round that passes through it. This was probably one of the most common uh, anti-tank guns made in World War II. We, we have tons and tons and tons of them. And also, if you think about service in the Pacific, this was more common. Like, the Marines would have these. They couldn't handle the heavier ones that the, um, that the, that the Army would have in Europe. Now, what kind of tank could this destroy? Well, any kind of Japanese tank, because their tanks weren't they, their tanks were light tanks. They weren't. They weren't. Now, could, this, could these um, also work against the Panzers? Well, they, well, the Panzers. That's a big, big word, Panzer. If you're talking about a Panther or a Tiger, it would bounce off. Um, those are the later war, the big, famous German tanks. But if you're talking about the Panzer threes, the Panzer twos, uh, you know, some of those are the the, the Czech variants, the PZ 38s. 
this could take one of those out, particularly if you hit it in the treads. Uh, this is a part of the uh, Mall Day uh, celebrations. Uh, we have various uh, army units from Civil War up through uh, modern uh, guard. People are welcome to come down and look at the uh, these are World War II jeeps we have out here. These are all originals. So who owns these? Uh, members of the group. The gentleman behind you, Paul Ray, uh, owns this one. He, he does all the work on it. Why? This is what, a 40, 44 Ford? Willies. So we have, have various items up here to, on display and different guns and uh, vehicles. Ooh. We're doing some uh, Civil War artillery demonstrations over there. If you want to come down and enjoy a nice warm afternoon, glad to have you. Tell me about this uh, vehicle. This is the 1151. It's on the Humvee chassis. Same platform was used back in World War One, or correction, World War Two, and Desert Storm when he first came out with the Humvee. Except for the only difference is it has upgraded armor package on it. Which, which this package, the doors don't weigh as much as the ones that are used in country. The ones in the country, the doors actually weigh 500 pounds a piece. So they're pretty heavy. These doors are still heavy. They're made of solid steel. And they will take your finger off if you get caught in the doors. So care is, great care is taken when we actually shut the doors. It sounds, sure. sounds like a good idea. Yes, great idea. Great idea. The downfall with this is by its size, the sheer size, the overall weight and width of it. It's a challenge to drive. It's very susceptible to roll over at higher speeds. So yearly we constantly go through driver's training and rollover drills to do to understand what happens in a rollover and what degree you can actually take the vehicle at a turn before it actually rolls over. Also, it has a lot wider line spots as opposed to your normal car. So anything that you think you see, you won't see. So it's best that you have at least three people in the vehicle so that you can actually see every corner of the vehicle and know where you are in positions of traffic. This also features the upgraded turret, which also has protection on it. You uh, provide protection to the gunners. This was the first generation of the turret that was used, which as you can see, it provides some protection, but not the greatest amount of protection. And what caliber, what caliber gun is that? That is a 50 caliber M2 machine gun. So that fires how many rounds a minute? That fire, it can fire up to 800 rounds per minute. Woo! It that's, will put some, it'll put a wall of steel down range. That's a lot of lead going fast. down the road. Yes it is. Yes it is. Hey. This glass is about three and a half inches thick. It's comprised of four plates of glass that are sandwiched together and heat sealed, which provide the best protection against small arms fire, as well as IED explosions and anything that anything that can be propelled towards you this class is the best thing you want to have between you and it and in the 1840s and 50s this was your standard uh, piece and it would be used against whatever you're fighting against uh, at this time of the civil war uh, they had uh, evolved the shell so that you had a hollow ball filled with powder inside or powder and various size small balls like marbles and being a howitzer means you're going to fire up and over rather than straight on so you would fire this up and over advancing in infantry it would explode and you have all these little shards of metal and these little balls raining down on the enemy which can cause them to say ouch in several times um, we could also use the solid shot against them because when you convert the, the potential energy of the gunpowder into kinetic energy of the explosion pushing that ball out, it's sort of like bowling. And a ball could take out six or eight men who were clustered together, which is the way most attacks were done. And shoulder, you do that shoulder, with the shoulder. Rifle piece because the, the rotation that's placed on the projectile by the rifled piece makes the uh, projectile act as a screw and ram it into the ground as opposed to the case shot or pardon me the solid shot of the smoothbore gun you can actually pull it. nasty piece of work now it's we, we haven't finished with nasty um, at three or four hundred yards 
we would use canister, which looks like a, a coffee can filled with little um, lead balls, which you'd run in. And once that canister uh, leaves the barrel, it breaks apart. So you have this huge shotgun's worth of uh, balls heading down to the enemy, which can literally tear them apart. And if they were getting really close, you might put two in at the same time. So you have double canister, and every once in a while for fun, they would do triple canister, which would rip up anything in its way. And it wouldn't do the gun any good, though, would it? I'm sorry? Is it likely to blow up the gun? Uh, that happened. That happened anyway. Uh, in war, you know, uh, you just get some more guys and another gun. It did happen. Um, there's a rifle uh, weapon called uh, the Parrot Rifle. And it's you can tell it because it has an extra iron band uh, at that end. And the reason that it had that was because it kept blowing up, killing the men who were manning it. They had those, they have those at Fort McHenry. Yeah. Uh, and the Union Army had a lot of those. Confederacy uh, had a lot of these. And if of I want the gun to be moved the to the right, I'll be standing like this, I'll tap it, you'll be using the trail spike to move it to the right, and the same thing to the left. That's how we go left and right. To go vertical, I use a pendulum hoss. The howitzer is can be elevated to five degrees from the horizon. This thing will go to five degrees. So if I'm thinking I want to get down past those trees, I will get behind the pendulum hoss and sight it and then turn my elevating screw to where I want. And when I think I'm there, we're ready to go. I've sighted the piece. And that's exciting. That's how it was aimed. Like I said, I think experienced artillerymen would basically do it by eye, and then within a shot or two, they'd have their target. And that's that's basically how they were aimed. And the reason why they use the hand signals is because war is loud. If they were just yelling back and forth at each other, something would get lost in the communications, and then they wouldn't be an effective artillery crew. So they use hand signals. To make it a much cleaner, simpler system. The command would be like, load, shell, 800 yards. And back there, he would uh, get a, sh a shell out of the limber, and um, they would cut the fuse. They want 800 yards. If I wanted to go shell 800 yards, I would need a four second, uh, I need to be elevated four degrees and uh, two second um, fuse length. And so that would be cut. It'd be loaded in up. Number five is going to be bringing that up when I ask him to. We're going to do this uh, by the drill by the command. And you have to remember, in 1860s artillery, fire is your best friend and your worst enemy at the same time. So half of an artillery detachment is getting ready to f use the fire and the other half is preventing fire from going off when you don't want it. Because then, um, as I said before, you have dead men not caused by the enemy and that's really, it, it makes the statistics really bad. So we're going to drill on order. The first order is brush vent. So he's going to make sure the vent is clear. Stop vent. That's he has a little, what's called a thumb stall. It's like uh, the thumb of a glove. To have uh, fire, you need air. His job is to make sure there's no extra air down there. And he will stay like that until he's told, given a, a different command to move. So no matter what the enemy's doing, shooting at him, calling him bad names, throwing shoes at him, whatever they're doing, his job is to stay there with his thumb on that. The next uh, command would be worm. 
And that's not a little crawly thing. This is a worm. It's used to extract uh, pieces of cloth that may be burning down there. Again, we don't want fire in there now. During the, the Civil War, this was not done very often. Since our ammunition is uh, wrapped in tin foil, we have to get the tin foil out. What we have are two hooks here, so we stick this in and then snag it, hopefully, and pull it all out. So our next command would be to worm. Make sure it's in. Next command is wet sponge. Again, we're not interested in fire yet. So what we're doing is swabbing out the breach so that any sparks will be extinguished. Because if they're not, and we put the next round in, my name will be Lefty for the rest of my life because my uh, arm and this thing will be heading down, down range. That's something I don't want to acquire, so we wet sponge. It's also not a very accurate projection dry sponge. This is a modern thing to make sure we don't have too much water down here, which would interfere with the gunpowder going off when we want it to go off. This is where we would sight the piece. Then I would say advance the round. Now you may be thinking that, well, the enemy, by the time you get this far, has probably overrun you and they're having breakfast with your wives. Uh, during combat, this thing went automatically. We're doing it a step at a time. Now, this is number two's job. His job is to stand here the whole time and take bullets and then put a shell in. At this point, we ram, and we're hoping there's no fire down there so that I become lefty. <coughs> All right, we're ready to go. <coughs> oh. Yes. And all of you right here, you want to get behind, make sure you've got the wheels in front of you, simply because it's kind of loud. Now, number three has poked the hole in the bag so that the gunpowder is exposed. The primer has been put in. It's kind of like uh, flicking your bit. And hopefully the spark from, from here will go down, ignite the powder, which will explode and send the cannonball down range. These two have to coordinate to make sure they're ready. Not them off when you're ready. Assume the position. And 